Hi, I am Lynn Kitchens. So glad to be here, be with you, be part of the teaching team. Thanks for chasing after God. We're all blessed by that. Thanks for making new friendships. It's wonderful. This semester we're chasing also after prayer. So in the Psalms we can look into the hearts and the prayers of David and others and find ways to draw near to God ourselves in lots of different situations. It was funny because I was talking to someone a long time ago who had just read Psalms for the first time. And um, it was a man and he said to me when it was done, I got so tired of David talking about himself. Okay, uh, so we kind of started talking about, hey, the Psalms is like opening up and reading someone's prayer journal. It is about them. It's about their lives, their fears, their hopes. It's about their faith. We learn so much. We can learn about ourselves. We can learn about God. Um, we can learn about faith. And then we learn how to approach God as they did, and we're blessed by that, and we grow while we do it. So today's Psalm of David is a song of sorrow. It's a psalm of lament. It's actually called a penitential psalm. And the word penitent means to feel and show deep sorrow and regret for something you've done wrong. And as I thought about it, I realized that penitent is the root word for penitentiary, which sort of makes sense. There's a place where people suffer for their crimes and it also makes sense because in this psalm, we see that David's in a type of prison himself as he laments the crimes that he's committed, the sins that he has done. And he's pleading in this psalm for the mercy of God as he suffers God's discipline. We don't know when it was written in his Life. We don't know the situation exactly. We do know that it was meant to be a petition to bring remembrance. That could mean a few things. This could mean David's crying out to God saying, Lord, remember me. This could mean David uh, is remembering himself, the discipline God gave him, and so he doesn't want to avoid those same mistakes in his life. Or David's reminding a whole community of the Jewish people as they're giving offerings so they can think, okay, this is what happened to David. I want to walk closely to God. I don't want to suffer those same things that David suffered. Regardless, you do not want to read Psalm 38 when you're having a bad day. You might never leave the house. You might go out and eat worms. Uh, but my first thought was, remember last week? Remember how happy David was? He was a happy guy. He had all this confidence and joy in the Lord. He used words like, it's beautiful, it's wonderful, it's a pleasure, it's a delight. I have such gladness. And then we go to a few pages past, we're in Psalm 38, and we think, what in the world happened to David? How do you go from that to this? Today, David is lamenting about being feeble and crushed, and he's in mourning. And But David himself solves this mystery for us. If we look back at Psalm 16, we're going to see why. So look on your verse sheet. This was last week when he was a happy guy, and this is what he said. I've set the Lord always before me. He's at my right hand, and so I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. So the simple answer is that this time in his life, when he penned Psalm 38, he had set other things before the Lord. He had set his selfish sins before the Lord, and now he was shaken. Now his flesh did not dwell sec secure. Now the Lord was not at his right hand, leading him. The Lord was disciplining him. David's sin had brought him to a prison, a penitentiary of inner and outer sickness. And good thing we don't expect God to discipline us like that today. Good thing we know he just wants us to be happy. 
That's what we hear. He just likes to wink at our sins and says, go on. We sort of um, inwardly want that. And we sometimes convince ourselves that that is true. But God wouldn't be a loving father if he worked that way. Our lives would be a constant misery if he didn't save us from ourselves. That's what he does. He alone holds the key to take us out of our prison. But remember, a penitentiary is a correctional institution, and correction takes time. So like any good father, he's going to discipline those he loves, but he does it in his timing. But didn't you love that verse in Job 5? where it said, you know, don't despise his discipline because he wounds you, but he binds you up. He might shatter you, but he heals you. So we're corrected. So we've grown. So we're better. So we can live that kind of purposeful life he has planned for us to live and to use us in his kingdom work. Look what Hebrews 12 says. Besides this, We've had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. The sorrows that we suffer from our sins and from God's disciplines are what we should call blessed sorrows because God will not waste them. He uses our sorrows to bless us. As a loving father, this verse tells us he wants to hand us the fruit that's peaceful, a fruit of righteousness in our life. And this is a fruit you and I would never taste without the discipline of God in our lives. Today we're going to find David in the middle of God's discipline, and it is an uncomfortable place to be, as we can all attest to. And so David is complaining about it. He's probably learning that God is more interested in our character than in our comfort. Something the world tries to tell us isn't true. It's absolutely true. So we're going to step inside David's prison cell. We're going to listen to his complaints. Chapter 38, verses 1 and 2. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath, for your arrows have sunk into me. Your hand has come down on me. And so David prays to be delivered from the experience of God's severe discipline. Now, David's admitting here that God's rebuke and God's discipline is something he deserves. He just wants God to lighten up a little. That's really what his prayer is. Moderate the severity of his chastening in David's life. The anger and the wrath of God feel like arrows in a heavy hand in David's life. Arrows, we know, often represent the judgments of God, and in this case, they are piercing David with physical and spiritual griefs in his life. You know, just a few years ago, Ted and I were uh, asked to go to a wedding. It was in um, Puerto Rico. Oh, I'm going to tell that story later. First, I want to read you this. Sorry. You're going to have to wonder what happened in Puerto Rico. Okay, here it is. God's law. I thought this was a great quote from Spurgeon. God's law applied by the Spirit to the conviction of the soul of sin wounds and injures deeply. It is an arrow, not lightly to be brushed off by careless mirth, not to be extracted by the flattering hand of self-righteousness. The Lord knows how to shoot his arrows So they not only strike, but they stick. This is what David's experiencing. And then God's hand, it represents his power in action. David feels like he's being crushed 
by God's disciplinary hand. And we can almost picture David pacing back and forth, wringing his hands, experiencing the wrath of God. He's praying here, don't do it in your wrath and your anger. He felt he could endure this discipline if it was consistent with the love of God. I like that because we can pray for God to be merciful when we know we need to be corrected and we know he's doing it. We can also pray for the mercies of God. I found an old prayer for mercy that's connected to this psalm I thought was so perfect. It goes with verses 1 and 2. Oh, Lord, rebuke me not in your wrath. Rebuked I must be, for I am an erring child and you are a careful father. But throw not too much anger into the tones of your voice. Deal gently, although I've sinned grievously. The anger of others I can bear, but not yours. As your love is most sweet to my heart, so your anger is most cutting to my conscience. David's going to continue these same kind of cries. He's going to list the depths of his pain. He bemoans his ailments that are related to his sin and God's indignation. Look at verse 3. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There's no health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head. Like a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and fester because of my foolishness. I am utterly bowed down and prostrate all the day I go about mourning, for my sides are filled with burning. There is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and crushed. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. Once his flesh dwelt secure, now there is no soundness in David's flesh. Once... uh, My husband, Ted, visited a man who was dying in a hospital, and the man told Ted he believed his sickness was related to his sin and the discipline of God. He had no doubt that all the choices he had selfishly made in his life had made their marks on his life, and he stopped running from God only as he lay in a hospital bed. Too late to serve God on earth, not too late to be with God in eternity as he made his confession before he died. And we know not all sickness comes from sin, but David illustrates that it can be. Spiritual pain can bring physical pain. It seems David's entire body is affected by his sin, his bones, his skin, his sides, his heart, his strength, his posture, his eyes. His emotional life is affected by his sin. He feels crushed burdened, depressed, bowed down, sad at heart. When sin is at the core of our illness, it is not a natural illness. It is a soul sickness. It begins in our heart. It weakens the body. A weak body brings a weakened mind. One person said this, if our troubles are the fruit of God's anger, we may thank ourselves it is our sin that caused it. In all these horrors, David understands it's his iniquities that bring about God's deep discipline. And without that understanding, we cannot approach God as we should. If we blame God, then we become bitter and he becomes our enemy confessing our sins and that our suffering is a result of them leads us into God's presence and then healing can begin. So I want to look closer at his sin. Let's look at verse 4 again. He says, My iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. Okay, over his head. I think the psalmist wanted us to picture waves waves that are deep and dark. He's in a deep sea, in a sea where a man sinks. Picture those waters. And someone's floundering. They're drowning. Those waves are covering their hopes, their dreams, their joy, their strength, their very life. Now we go back to Puerto Rico. So... (laughs) 
Ted and I were invited to a wedding there a few years ago, and I happened to be on this beach with some friends, and very close to us, like from here to that edge of that pew, was a, a deep kind of alcove of water, and a group of really young men were swimming in this alcove, having a great time. We could hear them talking and laughing. So we're just over here talking, and all at once, a lifeguard is really close to us, too. He takes off into the water, goes right there to one of these strong men and pulls him on the shore because he was out there drowning. He never called for a lifeguard. Nobody ever said anything. It was so strange. They pulled him on the shore, and we watched him taking his breaths. Uh, his whole chest would cave in as he tried to get air back into his lungs. And he lived... But what stood out to me was how quietly he was losing his life. And that's what sin's like. How quietly someone's sins can steal their life away. How silently our sins overcome us, overwhelm us, until we can swim through life no more and we find ourselves drowning under the weight of them. This was David. His iniquities were a constant dark terror that covered his very being. When he looks his sin deep in its face, he feels that weight of that iniquity. His sin are burdening him beyond his endurance. He says he's unable to bear it. It's impossible. It's impossible to live our life well under the heavy burden and the power of sin in our lives. We need a lifeguard. We need God. And like a good lifeguard, he's constantly watching us. He's waiting. He knows where we are. He knows we're drowning. We just have to look up, and he rescues us and begins the good process of discipline. David expresses in verse 5 that he was wounded by his foolish sins. And until he confessed them, these wounds grew and they festered. So the sins that were inside of David became wounds that lived outside of David. And we're going to see in a minute that what David looked like on the outside, um, eventually everyone became aware of what was going on inside. Unconfessed sins are painful wounds that expose our sinfulness to others. We are only fooling ourselves if we don't think all of our sins are affecting someone else. And to think they don't see them. You know, people see them and they look and smell like foolishness to those around us. David recognized his great foolishness, and so he goes about in mourning. And he wants us to picture here what they would mourn like. They would pay mourners, actually, to follow a corpse to its, to its tomb. And they would be weeping and crying. They would be covered in sackcloth and ashes. They would often drop into the dirt and express their griefs out loud and lament and cry. He's saying, that's, that's me. I can't even really stand up anymore. It's like I'm chasing death. Verse 10 is a summary of what he feels. My heart throbs. My strength fails me. The light of my eyes has also gone from me. To say your heart throbs, or in verse 8, the tumult of my heart, that means it's a heart that's not settled. It's constantly agitated. It goes to and fro. It doesn't know what to do. It's a heart that has no peace. And then he talks about his eyes. If you were with David and speaking to him, his eyes would look lost as you talk to him. They would look vacant. He may even have developed some kind of eye illness from all of his weeping and from looking at the disasters around him. I think looking at his body. There's a special light in the eyes of someone who walks closely with God. You all know what I mean when I say that. You can tell a lot by someone's eyes. You wouldn't find that in David's eyes. There was no joy. And I think the heart and the eyes represent the quality of a life inside a person 
They exhibit the peace and joy that are God's fruit that he gives us. He can give it to us alone. It means his presence is with us. Since David placed sin above God, the fruit of God's spirit is no longer visible in David's life. So he has this unsettled heart. He has these dim eyes, and he knows peace and joy. They've left me. And we can't manufacture that in our lives. We can try, but we can't do it. It comes from a disciplined walk with God, and then he's pleased to give us the fruit of peace and joy in our lives. So we have to maintain our spiritual health, and then this will lead to God's spirit in our lives, giving us these fruits. You know, I thought about David. We like to picture him young and handsome and sitting on the throne and reigning, and everybody loves him, and everybody wants to hang with David, and he gets to say and do whatever he wants, and it must be great. He was famous for his courage. He was famous for his great exploits, but he forgot to get off his throne spiritually. And when he chose to live his life enthroned above God at this time in Psalm 38, you would look at him and not believe he's a king. Weak and bent over, his hair is cut. Everything looks bad about him. So it's a great picture. We should never stay on that throne. We should never glory in our own strength. We have to call on the strength of God. We walk in his strength. We glory in his strength, which means we walk by his spirit. Look at Galatians 5. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. David has one more complaint, and I think this one would hurt as much as anything else. As he's looking at himself and he sees his personal torment, he looks up and there around him are the people he knows and loves and they are tormenting him too. What a horrible place they add to his pain. Look at verse 11 in your Bible. My friends and companions stand aloof from my plague and my nearest kin stand far off. Those who seek my life lay their snares. Those who seek my hurt speak of ruin and meditate treachery all day long. Those closest to David had abandoned him to his adversity, adding insult to injury. These are his friends, companions, his closest relatives. You know, some translations say they were his lovers. And what it means by that is those that loved life with him. Those that hung out with him, they laughed a lot. They had fun and joy. Those that went to Starbucks with him, they did Bible study with him. They had dinner with him. Instead, now they're aloof. They stand apart. They're uninvolved. And can't you guess what's going on also with that kind of behavior? Lots of talk, lots of gossip, lots of mocking, lots of judging. And then there are others that go beyond this. They plot evil against David. They see David's fall as a great opportunity for treason. So they spend their days plotting to have David fall, plotting for his failure. They're manipulating situations. They want him to be ruined. And it says treachery was their main thought all day long. While David's friends cowardly stand way over there and lend no aid, David's enemies are busy at work to ruin his life. It reminded me a lot of Jesus' parable of the priest and the Levite that are walking down a road one day. They see a beaten up, wounded, injured man on the side of the road where they are. So they go over to the other side of the road because they're self-righteous and they don't want to be around someone like that. And on they go. And then what the Jews would call a worthless man, a Samaritan comes along, sees the wounded man, picks him up, helps him, gets him on a donkey, gets him to someone who can heal him, gives money to help 
pay for his injuries to heal. And that's who we're supposed to be when we have loved ones lying on the side of the road, wounded in their sins. That's our job. How horrible when the first ones that should come to someone in aid that needs aid in their sins, we're often the last ones to come to their rescue. Here are a few reasons why we do it. One is jealousy. Another is it's so much more fun to talk about it. So much more fun to share it with other people and get to be the first one to tell them the news. So much uh, nicer to feel more righteous than someone else who's hurting in their sin. And also it's scary sometimes to approach someone who's in the middle of the discipline of God because they aren't always going to do everything right when you try to help them. Christians should be the first to help those injured by sin to keep their enemies away. Who are the sinner's enemies? Well, first of all, sometimes they're their own worst enemy. They can't get out of that sin. But you can help them. You can be praying, you can share scriptures with them, you can come alongside them. Then there are other enemies, people that would plot to keep the sinner in their sin. Then the enemies that would rejoice over their fall and plot their ruin, and then everyone's enemy, the devil, would love to keep a hurting soul hurting. Believers can be like a soldier. You know, in those old movies, I love old Turner Classic movies. Every time they show like a battle and men are in a foxhole and someone throws a grenade, there's always somebody that sees a grenade coming and run and throws his body to protect another soldier. And I love that. That's who we need to be. We need to fall over and protect our fellow soldiers in the faith with our love, with our concern with our prayers. We can also do that in their life. Okay, remember I mentioned that God's discipline brings sorrows, but they're blessed sorrows. We're about to see how that's true as well. David sort of turns from his complaining, and we begin to see that he really does go to God. He's trusting God right now. So let's look at that, verse 13. He had just told God about all his friends that speak badly and meditate on his treachery. And he says, but I'm like a deaf man. I don't hear. I'm like a mute man who doesn't open his mouth. I've become like a man who doesn't hear and in whose mouth are no rebukes. But for you, O Lord, do I wait. It's you, O Lord, my God, who will answer. For I said only let them not rejoice over me who boast against me when my foot slips. Verse 19. But my foes are vigorous, they're mighty. Many are those who hate me wrongfully. Those who render me evil for good accuse me because I follow after good. So our enemies sort of do us the most mischief when they cause us to sin. And that could have happened here with David seeking revenge and retaliation. But instead he does so well. He doesn't do that against his enemies. He doesn't speak. He doesn't take revenge. He behaves as if he was deaf and mute, even though they hated David wrongfully and despised the good he was trying to pursue. And these verses also let us know the people that wanted bad for him were the people David had done so much good for. David was bravely silent. He responded as Jesus would respond many years later when he was patiently silent before his accuser, Pilate. He was even quiet on the cross as soldiers and the Jewish leaders mocked and cursed him. Look at 1 Peter 2. When Jesus was reviled, he didn't revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't threaten. But he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And there's our answer. The only way we can be silent in unfair situations is to trust that God will act justly for us 
This is what Jesus did. So David speaks to God instead of his accusers and believes that God will answer. But for you, O Lord, do I wait. This is so hard. I wrote down to abstain from self-defense is a great discipline and a great faith. We have an advocate. We have a divine advocate in our Lord. We don't need to always plead our own case. Putting a hope in our words would be a false hope. Instead, we say, but for you, O Lord, do I wait? You're my just and loving advocate. I will wait for you. I'll be bravely silent. Look what Psalm 118 says. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. David's reminding God that he's chosen this good behavior here to also plead with God to restore him and to end his discipline. He doesn't want his enemies gloating anymore. And now he shares another reason that he asks for God's mercy. Look at verse 17. He says, I'm ready to fall and my pain is ever before me. David feels like he is on the very brink of his ruin. His situation is desperate. He uses the word fall or the word halt here. He feels like someone who is limping someone who is unstable, and he fears he might go through the rest of his life maimed. He was so depressed in his spirit that he would trip over the smallest stone, the smallest issues in his life he could not handle. And one writer said this, which I thought was good, David was like dry kindling facing the sparks of sorrow. He thought he was ready to burn up. Constantly plagued. So David was counting on the compassion of God to come to his rescue, and he would have known how God described himself to Moses in Exodus 34. Look at that. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. We also, I've done this, I'm sure you've done it, we count on the compassion of God when we think, I don't know if I can take another step. God, I'm giving you this day. Take these steps alongside me. Pick me up, hold me, take me along. It's God's mercy that strengthens us as we limp to the end of a sorrowful path. He has enough mercy for that. David continues his reasons he should be delivered. Look at verse 18. I confess my iniquity. I'm sorry for my sin. I love this. First he confesses his sin. Then he claims contrition for his sin. He's sorry for it. He stopped it. He's turned from it. It isn't enough to confess our sin and then just go out and do it again and confess it again and do it again. We got to hate it. We hate that sin. We're sorry about that sin. A truly penitent person grieves the dishonor that they've brought to the name of their Savior. So when sorrow leads to an acknowledgement of our sin, it's a blessed sorrow indeed. David both confesses and regrets his sin in true repentance. With his confession will come freedom. Remember, God's been holding the keys to David's prison. What's true for David is true for us when we feel imprisoned. We don't have to feel that way every day, all day, when we are going in confession to our God. Uh, I was at a conference many years ago, and I was talking to a woman, and we were talking about sin and, and confession and how horrible it is to go through the discipline of God. And then I said, you know, but knowing there's a God waiting, there's something so relieving, even if it still hurts, to know he cares and he loves me and he's there. I do love that feeling of going to God. And she just stared at me and said, that must be nice. I never get there. 
I just carry my guilt around with me. That's a prison that she's made for herself. I read about Thomas Edison the other day online about a time when it took them, a whole team of people, 24 hours straight to make one light bulb. 24 hours straight. So they had just made a light bulb. They were so excited. It was finished. And Thomas Edison handed it to a very young man who was a helper in their shop there. And he said, okay, take that upstairs and put that in the whatever. And the man looked a little, probably a boy or a teenager, looked up these long wooden steps with this light bulb in his hand. And he took a step, and he took a step, and he got more nervous and more nervous, and he got to the top of the step, and he dropped the light bulb. And he was so sorry. And the men all got to work soon after that, another 24-hour period, making another light bulb for 24 hours. And when it was done, Thomas Edison took it and turned to the boy and handed it to him and said, take it up the steps. That's the forgiveness of God. We're sorry. We go to him. He gives us another job to do. We're still his servant. He's pushed that out of the way, and he comes back to us with his love, forgiveness, and says, well done. Go and try that again. God hands us the deliverance when we humbly seek his forgiveness. 1 John 1, 1.9 tells us that. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Meanwhile, David is awaiting God's perfect timing in his release from his correctional institution. Look at verse 21. Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make house Haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. So we see three things that David prays here as he awaits his deliverance. Don't forsake me. Don't be far from me. And help me quickly. Three great prayers we can pray in the middle of God's correction in our lives. Be close to me. Don't leave me. Now is the time I need you the most. Help me. Quickly teach me the correction I need so I can get well. Be close to me also because that gives me courage. That gives me hope. That gives me strength. And meanwhile, we remember God is always near to his servants, and he won't delay longer than is best for us. We can remember that and also find hope to continue. How do we know he's this way? That's his job. He's a savior. But he's more than a savior. Look at verse 22. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. He's our salvation every single day. That means that we possess salvation as a present possession each day. He is saving us from ourselves. He is our salvation. David believed this. Look at verse 9. O Lord, all my longing is before you. My sighing is not hid from you. David leaves his desires with God, knowing that God understands the depth of his need. You know, even when our prayers are weak, even when we don't know what to pray, even when we feel like our prayers are hitting the ceiling, even if all we can do is sigh or have a longing in our hearts, God knows it. God's spirit grabs hold of it. God cares about it, and he intercedes for us. Our good physician, he knows the scope of our illness, and so we are safe in his hands. Because we have a heavenly father who is just and who is loving, all of the sorrows in our lives can be blessed sorrows. Let's pray. Lord, you are good and kind, and we thank you that you don't leave us to ourselves. 
but that you have great plans to use us and love us and restore us and give us the joy you want us to walk in. I pray we would believe that and seek you in that, and we give you all praise in Jesus' name. Amen.